No, I'm not having breakfast at the Four Seasons this morning. No, I was in a rush. So now I'm having a plastic breakfast at Plastic McDonald's that I paid for with plastic. Hmm. Now I can assure you this is not a happy meal. Why? Because right now I'm watching the street people dribble in with cups they snatched out of the trash with their dirty hands, but they're all standing contritely in line hoping for their free cup of morning coffee. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, the men and, and the occasional woman who I call the uh, great unwashed, yeah. Well, they're heading outside of the play area now with their coffee where they're gonna smoke and swap stories with their fellow unwashed while I have to concentrate on all the stupid emails on my smartphone. They're the same sleaze balls I see every day. I mean, they come right, right after dawn, they emerge from their secret hiding places where they spent the night. Yeah, probably outside the front door of our office building where I'm sure they goddamn peed freely. I've seen them near there before. I mean, on the street corners with their crude signs, pleading their cases with misspelled words and bad grammar, begging for any change, yeah, for food, of course. <laughs> yeah, why well, they smoke cigarettes that cost a Big Mac a pack. Okay. Well, look, I'll be in the office in about 30 minutes. Look, if my wife calls, tell her I'm already in court. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've got time on my schedule for that. <laughs> yeah, I love you too, baby. Okay. All right. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye. separates me from them. I mean, I feel displaced in a, when I have a very nice place. Envy their acceptance of each other. I mean, warts and all. When I think of the times I just, I didn't want to shave, didn't even want to bathe. But my social status, my job, my friends, even my wife expected. When I think about all the possessions that I just fell in love with, had to buy, and just fell out of love. I gave them away to some charity and they all mysteriously reappeared in different forms, different shapes, different needs, different pleasures. They were all st still there in that very nice place surround you. I mean, it was, then I realized that I was being suffocated 
by needs I didn't even need. Jeez, I can't eat this shit. So I decided to grab a piece of paper and a pen. And I started to write. And I wrote. And I wrote. Anything will do. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been a week since my last confession, but since then, I've been having some uh, impure thoughts. You know, when I woke up this morning, Father, everything hurt. I looked out the window to see what the weather was like. It was nasty. I was sorry I had a medical appointment because I dread getting pricked by that young doctor. Funny that word prick. I hadn't heard the word until my grandson called his friend one. You prick, he yelled. Why'd you call him that? I asked. Because, Nana, he's a dick. Well, <laughs> that's when I made the connection. I'd heard the word prick before. And the cock word. But penis was the first word I ever heard in connection with the male genitalia. The nuns talking about penis in biology class was always good for a snicker or two. See, the joke was they wanted us to know what a penis was so we could avoid it if we was ever confronted with one. <laughs> of course. My grandson has other words for it, like um, Woody and Johnson. I knew someone called Woody once, and he definitely was a Johnson. But you know, Father, it's been years since I was confronted with one. Sometimes I wonder as I look around the room at the old folks' home, how many of those old biddies ever think about a prick? I do, Father. Often. And that's why I come to confession. Father? Father? Oh, prick's gone to sleep. been to a nail salon in a long time. Hmm. I woke up late yesterday and staggered through my house wondering what to do with the remainder of my day. I lost myself somewhere. 
I don't know what to do with a day without someone who needs me. My hands are not used to idleness. I, they kept fumbling with the sash on the robe that I was practically living in. Look at my hands. Dishwater rough, broken nails. I don't remember the last time I polished them, and it doesn't matter. It wouldn't have lasted with the housework and the gardening. Huh. So I just gave up on them. I wonder when I gave up on myself. Like my hair. For a lack of time, or so I told myself, I took the scissors and I cut it off, Joan of Arc style, hoping that um, my husband and sons would notice. They didn't. They noticed when dinner was late or their pants weren't pressed. I noticed when the boys brought that stray mangy dog home, too. I knew I would be the one to care for it. <laughs> that dog proved to be such a consolation. It appreciated the love and the care that I gave him, and it broke my heart when he died. men were on a fishing trip. So I took a shovel and I dug a grave in my prize flower bed. I buried him there in my best towel, right in the roses. My uh, boys are gone now and my husband died recently from prostate cancer. Oh, I am definitely doing something about my nails today. Definitely. I feel safe in the garage. The garage is my domain, my territory. Every man in America should have his own space in the garage. Hell, I long since stopped letting the family park the cars here in my space. They've got the driveway or the curb out front. Too much of their crap, though, still occupies my territory. Some of the crap is okay, but the boxes and boxes and boxes labeled kid stuff is way too much of their crap. The kids are all going to college. We're just gone. For the kids, kids, my wife says. Then it will be for the kids, kids, kids. What about these six old TVs, she says? Or these old scraps of lumber? Or all these boxes of rusty old tools? I need those things. It hurts that she questions my stuff. I don't ask for much. I knows there's nothing in the house for me to relate to. It's all theirs. 
I don't like sleeping on floral sheets or bathing surrounded by bottles and jugs and beauty supplies or drying myself on pink sheets with lace trim, but I do it without complaining. All I ask is my own tiny oasis in the garage, some place I can call my own, some place that doesn't smell of deodorant, hairspray, and poopery, some place I can sweat. Yesterday, as I was oiling the lawnmower, the door opens, my wife sticks her head out. She says, honey, in that sweet, I need you voice that I love, this should make you happy. What is it, I say, my hope's up. There's a leak under the sink in the kitchen. Yeah. Oh, beautiful, for spacious skies and amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesty above the fruited plain. No, I'm not. My husband and I, we had an argument again. I don't even know what set him off this time. It, it's always some trivial matter that could be settled by simple common sense. I think that's what bothers me the most, is that he doesn't see that everything has a logical solution. Our hostility robs me of energy. Energy that I need to take care of the house and the kids. I mean, I was actually surprised to find myself wishing that he was dead. And then I was ashamed for even thinking such a horrible thing, but God, his death, that would really simplify my life. But then, how would I take care of the house and kids? If I were fin financially independent, I would have left his sorry ass years ago. From the moment I first saw him naked on our wedding night, our marriage was this huge disappointment. So this morning, when I got up, I did what I always do. I packed up the kids and I drove to Starbucks. And I'm sitting there wondering how I'm going to survive. And I catch my reflection in the mirror across the counter and, and I think, you know, you know, maybe if I, uh, but if I put on a little bit more makeup and, and I comb my hair and I lost a few more pounds and, and took better care of myself, I mean, I could be hot. But then I looked around. These men were passing the time on their cell phones and their computers and not one of them looked at me. And it hurt because I needed their validation. I was leaving and this really handsome man, he 
held the door open for me. It was a simple gesture, but at that moment, it meant the world to me. Do you mind if I ask you a question, I asked. <laughs> he looked a little startled, but he said, uh, sure. I'm ashamed to ask, but this morning, I'm a really desperate woman with a fragile ego, and I need you to be kind but honest. He said, go ahead. Would you? Would you pay good money to sleep with me? How are you? He asked. Good, I said, anxious to get on with my job. Hot enough for you? Yes, I said. Backing away from a table I had just cleaned with my hands full of dirty, heavy dishes. Well, I like the hot weather myself. Good for you, I said, trying to walk away. You like waiting tables? Sometimes. And it is the same every noon when he comes in. You know, at first I thought he was lonely, and then I thought he had a crush on me, <laughs> and then I just didn't give a damn, and I quit being tit friendly. I even tried being rude sometimes, you know, when his ego got unbearable. I have other tables to please, other people to make happy. Service is my job. I mean, you know, being kind and generous when I don't feel like being kind and generous. But I have a job to do. And I need my job. I'm putting my daughter through college. God, I need a smoke. So, today, my aggressive customer comes in. God, he was impossible. toward my next customer who had a look on her face that said, I'm in a hurry, bitch. So I forced a smile and I said, hi, how are you? And that woman yanked the menu from my hand and she said, why do you ask if you don't give a shit? So I plopped down across from her. You're right, I said, brushing crumbs from the table. I don't give a shit. But I will spit in your food. Now what would you like?
waitress, another whatever the hell I'm drinking. <laughs> okay, okay. It's only the third one. You're driving anyway. Besides, I need this. I've got to tell you two something that neither one of you is going to like. You both told me to dump that jerk. And I did. <laughs> but then <laughs> I got lonely. And I let the pick back in my life. What the hell is wrong with me? Why do I, why do I attract weak men? Because I can supplement my <laughs> will to theirs. That's why. I sit through hours of Monday night football. I even go with him to restaurants where breasts are referred to as hooters. He refers to my vagina as the playpen and his his prelude to sex is, do you want to do it? <laughs> Which has the opposite effect on me. Maybe you're right. Maybe I should just start dating lesbians. At least they know the lay of the land. Or to use his favorite phrase, how the plumbing works. Why is it so important? Sex. I see it time after time in magazine after magazine after magazine. Ten ways to have a better sex life. How to be orgasmic every fucking time. I tried it way too early. Way too early to be so disappointed. And I'm so tired of hearing you two go on and on about this great pleasure that still eludes me. An orgasm! <laughs> Waitress! Where is that fucking drink? I was angry. Why else would I have done what I did? And, and yeah, I, I should have known better. I actually, I grew up in an abusive family and um, my father was a hitter. And I swore that no man would ever, ever lay a hand on me ever again. So, So I'm married to this man who brings out the worst in me. I just, I hate the way he makes me feel. I just, it just it makes me feel angry and resentful. And why do I let him bring out the worst in me? You, you see, I'm, I'm actually really outgoing and he's, well, he's boring. And um, when I needed, needed some physical attention, some, just some closeness, he would refuse, just refuse to give it to me. And, um, That's, um, that's when I hit him. I know. I know it's wrong. I know, I know exactly how it feels. I just told you I grew up in an abusive family. 
and um, oh, the more the more I thought about his lack of response and just this refusal to stand up for himself, the more I resented him. And um, that resentment, it grew into loathing. And I hit him again. Um, and again, he didn't. He didn't stand up for himself. So, um, so I really, really lashed out at him. And I left this big, big handprint on his face. And, um, I left a big cash from my wedding ring. I just, oh God, when I, saw, when I saw that, I was horrified. I was horrified. I was horrified that I could be like my father, that, that I could do this to somebody that I once loved so much. Somebody that I had given a very large part of my life to. I saw the blood I wanted. I wanted, I wanted to apologize. I did. I really wanted to apologize to him. But then I just saw I had this, this messed up hurt look in his eyes. I, I couldn't. I couldn't. And so there he is, and he's just standing there, and he reaches up, and he touches the blood on his cheek, and he's looking at it, his fingers, there's blood all over his hand, and then he looks at me, and he... <laughs> he, just, he looks at me, and he says that there was a time that I would have given all of this for you. All of it. So, so I'm here. Here I am. I'm here. In anger management. how much longer I can do this. Sleep with a woman I no longer love but still find sexually attractive. For the kids, I've been telling myself, the kids are almost grown. Time's gonna come when that excuse is no longer valid. I started getting lonely when the kids started dating, getting lives of their own. 
It's a lot of lonely soccer moms too. We haven't been intimate in decades. For years I've just been masturbating in the shower. We're Catholic and have very little self-abuse. It's a lesser sin than adultery. According to gossip, Gossip, I was surprised to hear. I was a hot man. It's strange when the person you desire the most finds you just short of disgusting. It makes it hard to digest that anyone else could think otherwise. thought about what I had to do. I stood by the bed for a long time wondering if I should shower. I disrobed, climbed to the bed beneath the icy sheets next to the warm body. Just the thought of what I had to do going through my mind is giving me an erection. I'm sorry, dear. Sorry for what, she asked, turning her back to me. I've been thinking about this for a long time. Thinking about what? Sorry, dear, but I'm going to have an affair. She turned to me, and with a thin wisp of a smile, she said, Me too, dear. That's it, darling. Hold that pose. You know, your mother always did think of herself as an artist. It's what I always wanted to do. Now that you and your brothers were off to college or getting married, I decided I would fulfill my life's desire. I had enough money from the divorce. I was independent and owned my own, with no one demanding my time or telling me what to do. So I cleared out your bedroom, set up an easel. I bought all the supplies, and I enrolled in an art class. Ooh, the first day of class, I couldn't concentrate on drawing. All your mother could think about was the nude model and his private parts. <laughs> could I actually draw a man's penis? <laughs> I changed my place in the class. Uh, maybe your mother could sketch the young man's buttocks without having lewd thoughts. Nope. No way. <laughs> so I brought fruit. I fruit at the market, 
and I set up a still life at home. But the banana. <laughs> Ooh. A week went by. That fruit rotted. It rotted on the windowsill. And still no art. I lugged my supplies out, out on the lake and waited for a sunset. Sunset came and it went. No art. Now I was a little embarrassed. For years, I had been complaining to my friends that I was a suppressed artist. Huh. That my soul craved to create but I'd been too concerned with the needs of my family to take the time. And frankly, dear, I resented you all for it. Now I had only my own needs and the art wouldn't come. I felt like a fraud. I was sad for a long time. Hmm. Well, finally, I invited my friends over. I opened a bottle of wine and I announced to them, I am going to exhibit my works of art. They were happy, happy that your mother had, had found the time to realize my life's ambition. I approached a large easel, it was a frame that was covered, and I began. It has taken me too long to understand what real art is. And I reached up and I yanked the cover off the easel. They gasped. <gasps> and then they laughed. <laughs> and then they applauded. Because on the easel was a large colored portrait of you and your brothers. I know I don't look like the average guy. Believe me, I've heard it. When I had a job, my fucking asshole boss let me know. Hell, even my stepmom, God rest her soul. She didn't like beard, she didn't like mustache, she didn't like long hair. And I like people too much. So I've had to work on my indifference. It's taken me years to perfect the tune out. I've seen it for some time now. I don't know what to blame it on. I think it's the time we live in. I mean, people would rather communicate on Facebook than meet person to person. I've seen it mostly in the young. The way they walk into a space without even noticing anyone. With blinders on, my grandma would say. Why would anyone want to do that? miss the opportunity to communicate with another human being. Even animals need that. I've witnessed 
the dining tent. People who eat in cafeterias without communicating. Is this the walking Ted? It reminds me of those zombie movies. Dead eyes and pale, expressionless faces. I want desperately to communicate, make new friends, have new experiences. I wonder if I sink deeper and deeper inside myself, shutting out the world around me, hiding my true feelings. How much longer will it take until I begin to morph to one of the undead? Get alive! Fuck you! You know, as I count the years, I'm amazed that my husband and I have been together as long as we have. And sometimes um, I wonder what would happen to me if, if anything were to happen to him. Can I cut? I don't like that. Okay. I'm not real. Okay. Mm -hmm. Stand by. Okay, action. <laughs> You know, when I count all the years, I'm amazed that my husband and I have been together as long as we have. And as we grow older, I sometimes wonder what will happen to me if anything happens to him. You know, I don't have any skills. Well, except keeping house and raising children. I suppose I could use those skills to sustain me, but the thought of cooking and cleaning after someone else, it's, well, I just can't stand it. <laughs> Besides, I have done enough of that, amen. Yes, I could possibly ask the children for help, but I wouldn't want to do that. Oh. They're good kids, but you know, they're out in the world establishing themselves. And besides, the thought of being dependent on them, it's just, well, <laughs> you know, the other day, I was fiddling around and I glanced at the clock and my heart sank. It was almost dinner time and I hadn't started it. You know, he likes to eat as soon as he gets home. So I rushed towards the kitchen, and, but I stopped at the family table and looked at all those scratches and marks and remember all those years I tried to pledge away all of that? Now they serve as fond memories for me of erector sets and science kits and science projects and oh, and all that homework all the homework. Anyway, I go on toward the kitchen when the back door opens. Oh my gosh. There he stands in the doorway in his dirty work clothes, giving me that sideward smile. <sighs> and something stirred within me. And as I looked at him, I thought, when was the last time I saw him the way I did when I was a young girl? And oh, God, we were so in love. When was the last time I, I thought of him as my lover? And not just the father of my children, my husband, my protector. I rush towards the refrigerator when he says something which I don't hear. What did you say, dear? I say. He looks at me and he says, Baby, how about we go out tonight for pizza?
to this day, I am still fascinated by all the magical things that adorned my mother's dresser. The assortment of perfumes, powder, and cosmetics. There was nothing ordinary on that dresser. No tiny, cheap bottles of perfume, but giant, fragrant, crystal bottles of Chanel No. 5 <clears throat> and Shalimar. Mostly dark with age. Men from ships brought those magnificent bottles from places with exotic sounding names like Aruba, Caracas, the Azores Islands. Did she ever appreciate those gifts? or even know what they were? Thinking back, I doubt it. She would have been happy with a bottle of Blue Waltz from the Woolworth because she was a woman with all the classy accoutrements and none of the class to pull them off. She thought nothing of wearing pearls and rhinestones. Even at the early age of 10, I knew better. So I dressed her for her nights out on the town, her nights out looking for a new daddy. There were six of those. At places like hmm, the Gangplank <laughs> or the Dew Drop Inn. Hmm. I would pick out her dresses, fasten her bras and girdles, Buckle the straps on her shoes. It was the mid forties, and Ella singing Cow Cow Boogie soared from those black shiny discs that she played on her phonograph. Sometimes, before she would leave for one of her nights out. She would take me driving in her slant-back Buick to the Hula Hut or the Golden Arrow Drive-In for a burger and a malt. On special occasions, like when she was meeting one of her merchant marine friends, <laughs> she would make me dance with her at the Old Kentucky Inn, embarrassing me. I was never proud of her. I didn't even like her much. That only happened years later, after her death. When I began to realize the uniqueness of her. trick. That's when I see this guy out of the corner of my eye. He asks me a question. Hey boy, what are you up to? And I say to him, about 50 bucks? <laughs> That's what I notice his wedding ring. So I ask him, does your wife know that you like to fuck younger men? <laughs> Look at him run.
For as long as I can remember, the men with women stared at me. At an early age, I remember thinking that they could see into my soul. Well, I was different. It's the way I dressed, the way I walked. I don't know, but whatever it was, I didn't want it. I didn't want to be so different that someone could read my thoughts and tell my sexual preference. At that age, I didn't even know what my sexual preference was. All I knew was that the way the men with women stared at me made me feel insecure and self-conscious. As a child, the men with women touched me. Later, the boys with girls in the neighborhood experimented sexually with my young body. Years later, I realized that they, the men with women who walked down the streets holding their girlfriends' hands, and the boys with girls in the neighborhood who abused me in alleyways and abandoned places, they went on to marry and have kids of their own. They were just as confused and insecure as I was. was though I didn't fuck with their souls <laughs> fuck you man I want to thank all of you for coming to honor our dear friend Jim who passed away recently. These gatherings are getting to be too frequent and too hurtful and too difficult. Personally, they make me think of my own mortality. Yesterday I was driving home from work and it had been another shitty day. And I had all these negative thoughts rattling around in my head. And I had this, this uncontrollable urge to steer my car into oncoming traffic. Oh, I'd had similar urges before. I mean, in some ways, it would be a relief. Because I wasn't keen on life. My life had become dull and uneventful. Ambition eluded me, you know? And I wanted nothing, I, I needed nothing, not even sex. Hell, when I was a young man, sex motivated me. I woke up every morning with this erection, anticipating all the pleasures of the day. But now, sex is the enemy. And it's killing our friends. And those of us who have survived this, 
This sexual holocaust do not want to die like our friends, being kept alive with a fist full of pills? Oh shit, if that ever happened to me, ever happened to me, I'm turning the wheel. The sun is coming up again. And once again, I'm hating myself. <sighs> My head hurts. I'm disappointed in myself. I feel like I'm about to throw up. I'm a user. And I don't want to be. <sighs> what? is wrong with me. Every time, it's the same. As soon as I come, I want to go and I want to get the hell out of there. What seems so fucking hot before the orgasm, seems so goddamn dull afterwards. How do people do it? You know, that was the question I asked myself as I ran out of that girl's apartment quickly and quietly. How do people? Well, I mean, example, like my parents. They're in it for the long haul if they don't kill each other first. I mean, I tried to think of my longest relationship as I ran down the stairs two at a time, hoping no one would see me coming out of that girl's apartment. She was fine enough last night when I was drunk and desperately horny, but God forbid someone think I'm actually that desperate. It was seven days. One whole week. That's my longest relationship. It's really sad. I mean, knowing my track record, didn't even make it the whole 168 hours. It's pathetic. Every time I fuck and I run, I tell myself it will be the last time. I give myself all the right reasons not to. But those thoughts, they plague me. And I cringe at the word plague. I have just enough time to get home and take a shower. I need a shower. Well, it's about time you took that smelly garbage can out. Yes, I lugged it to the curb and deposited it there. And then you stood gazing about the neighborhood as if expecting something to happen. Yes, but nothing 
was going on. So I came back to the kitchen. And now you stand staring down at the empty garbage can? Yes, yeah, so I'll have to go under the sink to get the garbage bags. Open this. Oh, now where is that box of garbage bags? I, I know it's under there somewhere, somewhere along with the Drano and hundreds of other chemicals I long ago forgotten purchasing or what they were used for. But I do remember buying them at the time, hoping that they would make my life easier. Yes, and now all you do is obsess over the proper way to dispose of them. Oh, oh my, there's a large dead cockroach lying there, belly up. It's spindly legs pointing heavenward. Oh, you poor little creature. I, I feel sorry for you. What was the last chemical you dined out on? I bet it was this Drano. You didn't read the warning label on the back, did you? I wonder uh, how long it takes a chemical to kill something. What does it taste like? Is it painful? I'm so lonely sitting here in my tiny kitchen. <laughs> oh, but I can fantasize about all the men in my life. Every man I come in contact with, I immediately fall in love with. And they, well, oh, they, they want me. They desire me, but they're silent, subdued by my beauty and unable to tell me how much they want me. Mm. Oh, there's the young waiter at my favorite restaurant. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, <laughs> and then there's the postman who smiles at me with crooked teeth. Oh, and I can't forget the slightly balding TV salesman who touched my arm when showing me a TV. <laughs> and then there's the market with the Mexican butcher and the, with this tattoo of Our Lady of Guadalupe on his chest. <sighs> For a moment, do you consider that they are merely doing their jobs, providing you with a service? Oh, they don't desire me. They don't desire me. Oh, they don't want me. What is this warning? This warning. Keep out of the reach of children, danger of suffocation. I, I wonder what it would feel like to suffocate. Oh, oh the smell of plastic. I love that smell. You never were a very good swimmer. Couldn't hold your breath for any time at all. 
is the right thing to do. just looks dead, <laughs> which in her case is quite an improvement. Mm. All these years, her main occupation has been dying. Every little pain, every little ache, every hurt was like a death sentence. A pain here was cancer. Here was an aneurysm. <laughs> and just body aches everywhere. Oh, that was a giant thrombus coursing throughout her body. You heard her message. Hello. Leave a message and, and if I'm still alive, I'll call you back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. She desperately needed attention. In fact, her need for attention was what drove me and all her family members away. Need for attention and her nastiness. Ah, there was the syncopated drumming of the heart Oh, and the ballad of the sluggish bowels. Uh, the aria <laughs> of the acid gallbladder. <laughs> oh, and the kidney bladder chorus. Always with some kind of encore that included gross details of every bodily function. <laughs> we called it her organ recital. Oh, man. <laughs> the last few years, only her greedy grandson would listen to all of those complaints. He'd sit for hours, but even then, only on the required holidays. And when he'd visit her, it was always just with such dread. But he is inheriting all of everything in her will, her ever-changing will. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Nobody here, just the two of us. And you know what's funny? At her last birthday, when nobody showed up, she told her grandson, well, if they can't respect me while I'm alive, I don't want them coming to my funeral either. <laughs> well, looks like you got your wish. <laughs> mm. in my handbag without paying for it. And I had money and a wallet full of credit cards. It's an impulse. Brought me enough to pee my panties. 
the ladies room? I asked the saleswoman when she turned back towards me. Had she noticed some missing bundles? Did she tell her manager or, or worse? Police? Down the right in the dressing area. You know, said the haughty woman in the basic black dress. She had this smile that stretched across her face like a like a wide red rubber band. Ah, I don't know why I took it. I don't know. You know, I chastised myself as I hurried towards the dressing area. I don't need a fucking blouse! So in the ladies' room, I, I pull the blouse out of my bag, and it's a hideous color, and cut totally wrong for my neck. I look like shit in this, right? So, so I, so I shove the horrifying dress or blouse into the waste basket. I carefully covered it with Kleenex and tampon tubes. And I hurried into the stall. Well, I pulled down my pantyhose and I yanked down this wad of toilet paper. I stabbed the pee that had run down my leg. sat in the middle confines of that stall. And I just wondered about my life. How did it come to this? What would my therapist say? If, if I had the courage to tell her. I will tell her. I mean, why do I keep going to her and, and paying her all this money if I can't be honest? I mean, why am I embarrassed by the truth anyway? So? thought back to the moment, the um, idea to steal the blouse flashed across my mind. Yeah. Rush. The thrill of it. Mm -hmm. In the quiet stall with the ladies room in Neiman Marcus. God. It's better than sex. Ugh. Or, you know, without the complications of another individual. Or you know, at least the sex I've had recently. So, I brightened. I stood up. And I ran out of that stall more shopping to do. It's, um, something I desperately needed. Mm. Bigger purse. Mm.
wanted to scream during sex for the longest. Not just lie there, all stiff and frozen, afraid to move. I crave variety. But the missionary position is the only position our lovemaking ever takes. I try to understand why he feels that way. We are Catholic. Oh! Anyway, tonight I did it. Revealed how I really feel during sex. I bought a book with pictures of partners in different positions. I locked myself in the bathroom and opened that book. There are so many positions. I really, really liked the Dale Evans, Queen of the Cowboys position, where the woman straddles the man. I'm tired of being buried under him. He's gained so much weight since we got married. I feel trapped, suffocating almost. Not a partner, as the book suggests. The book also says part of the fun of sex is the surprise of it, the unexpected, to keep it entertaining. Well, you know I was shocked. I never thought of it as fun or entertaining, just an obligation, work. Anyway, tonight I decided to try the Dale Evans position. Do just as the book suggests, climb on top and ride off into the sunset. I know the signs when he expects sex. Threw back the covers, climbed on top, dug in my heels and sang, happy trails to you until we meet again. That's when it happened. Just like it happened on our wedding night when I moved to scratch an itch. He went limp rolled over, muttered something under his breath that sounded suspiciously like whore, and pretended to sleep. I yanked those covers back up and wondered if I could return the damn book. I've lost my last hiding place. And what was my husband doing looking in the clothes dryer? He's never washed a load of clothes in 30 years of marriage. I, I don't know what irks me more. His finding it or his lack of faith in me. You can't be trusted, he says. So, I could lie. I'll tell him that the maid, that was there before, but we both know that the, the maid has washed dozens of loads of clothes since I had to take his mandatory oath. He was snooping around, looking for it. I 
I didn't snoop around when he swore he'd stop smoking. I mean, I took him at his word. I mean, I even cut him some slack when he, I could smell it on his clothes, that lame story about a friend smoking in the car. <laughs> sitting here looking at an empty dryer and I can feel myself start to shake with self-loathing. I'm the wife of a powerful man. I I have two beautiful children. I, I live in a grand house in a gated community. I'm beloved by all for my charity work. I could justify it and point to those women in my circle who do it. I mean, they introduced me to it. I was just curious at first. And now the thought of it occupies most of my once busy day. I know all the words. Junkie. Stoner. Addict. Crackhead. Addict. And the word I used when I started. <laughs> Recreational. <laughs> I'm sweating. And my hands are trembling. Did this happen to me? I was in the fucking junior league. say for myself, huh? Well, for one thing, why'd the woman ever marry me? I wasn't perfect. Well, maybe she thought I was when we married 18 years ago. Her idea of me sure changed through the years. Little by little, I just seemed to disappoint her while she sought perfection every place else. <coughs> How'd I disappoint her? <laughs> well, first is probably my weight, all right? I guess, and then, uh, my hair began to thin to turn gray. I guess to compensate, she started buying my clothes. Laying them out for me each morning like my mom had done when I was a snot nosed little kid. Did it bother me? <laughs> Hell yeah, it bothered me. A few years ago, she moved me into the trailer's second bedroom. So I wasn't allowed back in her room. So I bought her the double wide, I promised. I wish now we had kids. Somebody to give my love to. I had to settle on the cats. Why settle on the cats? Well, you see, cats can be pretty damn independent, right? Well, at least they allowed me the pleasure of their company, and she wouldn't. The 
trailer continued to change. Last year's items were replaced with the newest versions. Wondered if she didn't secretly want to replace me with a new version. But, the subject of a divorce never came up. I guess she's probably doing the same thing I was, making the best out of a bad situation. You know, it's like Jerry Springer says, you can become compatible with incompatibility. I mean, why else would I want to stay married to this bitch? Yeah. Maybe I was just <laughs> getting too old and too lazy to move all my shit out of the trailer. Why am I so angry? Because one day I looked up to see her standing over me. Her face all messed up. And I'm wondering, did I fart? No, not lately. But my body stiffened up anyway because I knew I was about to get an ass chewing. For God's sake, won't you cut your toenails? They're disgustingly repulsive. And pick up the clipping. There's enough of you messing up my house already. And that is why I had to kill the fucking bitch. Is that better? just ask you for some service here. No, I'm not here to adopt. I'm here to get Fluffy, a randy little toy poodle I have to walk on the end of this thing, begging it to poop. I just sent the mutt here, in a van with one of your people. Now I need to get him back. Look, it was my wife's dog, okay? She passed recently. I promised her on her deathbed that I would take care of the mutt, even though it only tolerates me. Bit me more than once. Peed in my shoes. Everything in the house reminds me of her. Especially the damn dog. It mourns her passing. It lies by the front door, waiting for her to return. I'm refusing to eat and it worries me. I sit in my damn recliner, watch the blurry images on the TV. I mislay my glasses. When my wife was alive, she knew where I left everything. Last night, I glance over to her chair. There's Fluffy curled up asleep. The dog looks up at me and it startles me because I found myself wanting to like the animal. Hell, I'm just lonely, I thought. The dog's just too painful a reminder. I admit it. I miss my wife something awful. So, I call the animal shelter, thinking you people could find someone to give the dog the love it needs. The love my wife lavished on it. And give it a good home for the few remaining years of its life. But 
this morning. I felt a flush of guilt under the dog's bewildered gaze as your man carted it off to the waiting van. A sudden struggle, the dog leapt from his arms and ran back to me. I was confused, such unexpected behavior. I scooped up the dog. It was trembling all over. Handed him back to your man and turned back to the house. I couldn't watch the van drive away. I strode back through the early morning mist that hovered across the lawn. The lawn I could see was turning brown with neglect. Stumbled into the house. It was quiet. Too damn quiet. Miss, help me here. Help me get my dog back. Yes, thank you. It was a, a wonderful service. And yes, I really appreciated the memories and stories people shared about Mother. It makes it a bit easier. Am I? <laughs> Belle. Oh, Belle was Mother's beloved 1980s Oldsmobile with the plush blue velvet seats. I mean, sure, it was a gas guzzler, but she never went any further than the, the market or Mr. Jean's hair salon. <laughs> you know, Mr. Jean had styled her hair every Wednesday at 10 a.m. for 20 years. Oh, and she never could recall ever missing an appointment. <laughs> Nor had her hairstyle changed much in the 20 years. I mean, Mr. Jean lacquered it so it lasted the entire week. I mean, in fact, she could sleep on it without moving a hair. <laughs> oh, she had only one concession, though. Rue's blonde minx to cover the gray. <laughs> oh, she hated, oh, God, mother hated gray hair. She hated getting old. I mean, she couldn't relate to the old bitty snoozing under the hair dryers. She wasn't wrinkled like they were. I mean, she took care of her skin. She cold creamed her face every night. <laughs> A ritual that drove my father to the spare bedroom. <laughs> she smoked when I was young. I mean, and thankfully, she quit early enough so she didn't have the, uh, the sun-dried hide of the friend she had left. <laughs> she was secretly pleased when people mistook her for the youngest of the ones that smoked. <laughs> but, um, but she did something stupid and, and fell and hurt her hip. She had to use a walker. She used the one my grandmother had used that, that she had hid in the back of the closet. Oh, she hated, hated that damn thing. On the morning I was to drive her to the care home, she struggled with that walker, I mean, through the kitchen. And she stared at the carport where poor Belle was covered with dust. A mother turned to me and, and said she wanted to climb back inside Belle and drive away. She had outlived my father and most of her friends. 
just drive. Just drive, she said as I walked her to a car, my car. Away from the house I grew up in, I mean, away from the house that she's lived in for 40 years. <sighs> and then she, um, gosh, she said the most amazing thing. She said she wanted to put Belle in reverse and drive backwards through her life. It was then that I, I got the idea and I turned her toward the carport, towards Belle. Would you do anything differently, I asked. <sighs> she didn't answer the question. She just held my hand. <laughs> I knew the answer. <laughs> thank you. I mean, thank you all for coming. Mother would have loved it. Since we've been discussing the Civil Rights Movement, I would like to tell you what it was like for me as a girl growing up in the South in the 50s. Now for as far back as I can remember, I had always been in awe and admiration of black people. But when I was a girl, there was no such thing as politically correct or incorrect. So the N-word was bandied about casually freely. This was due to ignorance, to insensitivity, to cruelty, and to innocence. I remember skipping rope with my friends singing any mini miny mo, catch a nigger by his toe. To this day that nonsensical rhyme still haunts me. Then there was my child's delight in a certain kind of candy. May I please have a nickel's worth of nigger babies? I ask as I eyed the glass jar full of licorice candies in the shape of tiny black babies. When my dad failed to properly connect the washer and flooded the house, my mama yelled, why do you have to nigger rig everything? Now this was all so confusing to my little girl's mind. How was it that black people could have funny rhymes and delicious candies named after them and yet be blamed for the mess my dad had made? These mysteries further confused me when I realized that the blacks had their own section of town and there was no section called white town and they had their very own water fountains and their own entrance to the movie theater where they got to sit up in the balcony now i had seen pictures of the queen of england waving down to the crowds from her balcony so i knew that only the very best people were allowed up there. <laughs> I so wished I could go up there and wave to all the common people below. I really realized what a special place it was. One day when I heard a little black boy ask his mama, Mama, why do we have to sit up there when everybody else gets to sit downstairs? Because 
the mother took her son by the hand and slowly led him up the steep, narrow steps. Because, baby, up there, we's closer to God. <laughs>